Hey guys, are you ready to take on the Trinity? So hey and welcome back to another episode of A Different Atheist Reads. I'm Christy and this week we are going to be looking at the first part of chapter four entitled, I can't remember, it's entitled The Trinity, The um, Trinity, the Christian God. Karen uses about the first third of this chapter to discuss one idea, which is the Trinity. And she doesn't just kind of explain the Trinity um, over time and all of the debates around it. Instead, she focuses very much on one element of the Trinity debate. Karen never really explains why she decides to spend a third of a chapter on one element of the Trinity debate. It's not even comprehensive in terms of all of the elements and facets that went into it. And instead of, you know, giving an overview in order to provide the reader with some orientation, she goes into the personal issues. And Basically, in my view, in, in, when it comes to a history of God and looking at two different positions on the nature of Jesus, it's really what we're dealing with a handful of men thought, and I don't care what they thought because it's not as if their theological musings have any basis in reality. They're talking about issues such as if something is created, is that different from being begotted? And it's really just angels dancing on the head of a pin. So. I'm not going to spend our time with nonsense that has no basis in reality, uh, so I'm not going to be doing the chapter that Karen wrote. I'm going to be looking at the chapter Karen should have written, in my opinion. So um, a quick time out. I just want to point out that since starting the lecture series, I've now watched three different university lecture series on early, uh, like the, the Bible, early Judaism, or early Christianity. And since the last time I did a video for you guys, I watched seven videos from a theological seminary course on early Christian thought. So when I say, like I just did, that I'm not going to spend my time talking about nonsense ideas and that these debates really just are not worth going into, you can believe me. If you don't, I'll put links. I think it's on the, the master playlist, everything I've watched anyway, and I'll put a link to that in the description box below. So if you want to hear all of the seminars that I've listened to to prepare for this lecture, you should definitely go ahead and enjoy yourself. But since I'm going to assume that you'll trust me, what I am not interested in doing and not interested in reciting are as a precise list of the logical contradictions that early Christian thinkers managed to get themselves into because it really does come down to angels on the head of a pin. There's no way to verify any of these claims. Instead of going over the minutia of pointless theological arguments, what I want to do instead is to look at the ideas that interest me in this chapter, and that is the process that the Christian faith underwent in order to become compatible with Greek thought. So instead of reviewing the chapter that Karen wrote, I'm going to give you the chapter she should have written. <laughs> and my thesis is this. Christianity is the result of men who were intent upon forcing a Jewish belief system into compatibility with Greek thought. In my view, that is the story of the Trinity. And so I'm going to do about half of chapter four this time, and I'll address the remainder of it in the next video. And we'll again try to pull out the concepts and the attributes um, about the Christian God and then compare that with as far as we got with Yahweh before Karen walked away <laughs> in chapter two. Another time out. I think I still, I, I've got just two and a half, so I haven't used them all up yet. Um, before we start on the discussion about the Trinity, there's a concept in political science that isn't all, isn't so popular, but it is one that is used. And I think it, it's actually, it's very helpful uh, for us when we look at the Trinity. And that is the theory of path dependence. Path dependency is an attempt to explain how people's decisions are constrained at later points in time because of decisions they'd made in earlier points of time, sometimes generations ago. Path dependence explains how the set of decisions one faces for any given circumstance is limited by the decisions one has made in the past, even though the past circumstances may no longer be relevant. So, for example, one of the key moments, in my opinion, and this isn't like, you know, like an insight or anything, but with the series and the points that I'm trying to bring out to hit home for you, is that there were certain decisions that 
It altered the course of Jewish history. One of those decisions was a devotion to the Yahwehist cult. The idea of one God being above all others and eventually that becoming their being an only God, but this exclusive relationship between the Yahweh cult and their God of Yahweh being promoted within an, and replacing basically polytheism within a culture is completely unique. And once the I think it was Hebrews at the time, they weren't quite the Israelites yet, and they weren't the Jews because Judah didn't exist, so call them the Hebrews, um, had made that decision to commit to monotheism, then basically every polytheistic option becomes off the ta gets taken off the table. And for the rest of history, for everybody who follows in that tradition, you can't go back and re-debate polytheism. Polytheism is a settled issue in Judaism, and then you just move forward. And now, yes, there might be individuals who have a practice or a synchronistic or leave the, the faith, but the faith itself is now conceptually de like determined based on its monotheism. Another moment in time I think that we can mark as determining the path of the future was the centralization of worship, the idea of smashing all of the high places and making Jerusalem the only place where sacrifice could be offered. That transformed the way that people re engaged in their worship it transformed the role of the temple and it transformed the role of Jerusalem forever. So this is what path dependency means and it's a way for us to understand the confines within decisions within which decisions have to be made. This is important for Christianity because of the implications of Greek thought and the way that adopting a Greek worldview would then make certain other outcomes path dependent. I also want to set up a few more ideas because I'm going to contrast them a little bit later with what the Christian God ends up looking like. But I want to point out again that the key ideas here uh, in Judaism is that God is completely other and different, c disconnected from human experiences and the profane, the common world. That both good and bad things came from their god. Eventually dualism would become more prevalent, but early on we see Yahweh taking credit for the light and the darkness. And we also see an anthropomorphic being that has emotions and attachment and prefer preferences, likes and dislikes. And it's a very, that's the, the god of the Jews. And this notion of god, because it's quite, has a long history and it's quite flexible, the ability to worship that God in your own way within the confines of the religious faith, we see some flex flexibility there. Right. So when, the, when there was an opportunity to impose religious beliefs on the people by the Jewish government, we saw that happening. We saw it with whoever, I want to say Josiah, but I think that might be wrong, the guy who, you know, smashed all the high places and centralized the worship. And when they did have control over their religious practices, there was an attempt to use the power of the state to enforce certain kinds of beliefs. However, it is also the case that there was an oral tradition, there was a the, the law, written law tradition, there was a lot of variety within Judaism in terms of sex. And it has, I would say, one of the things that characterizes Judaism is that it has not a clear idea of God, but it has a confidence in its understanding of the concept of God. And it also allows within a range uh, for a plurality of beliefs. It tolerates a range of practices that are considered acceptable. And I want to contrast that with the very insecure and psychologically um, needy Christian church. In first century Judaism, you have this apocalyptic strain coming from Daniel that has the view that the world is so terrible and evil and so lost that at any moment God is going to intervene in human history. He's going to identify the physical descendant of, of the king of David and put that male descendant on the throne in Jerusalem with God's power behind him and that Jerusalem would become this great center of worship and leading the way in the worship of God and that all nations you know would look to Jerusalem as a beacon. There's also the overwhelming force in my view of Greek thought and Greek culture that is happening and I would point to evidence of this um, as being Philo in his writings, his attempt to sort of f make these two worlds worldviews more compatible, and also the fact that the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek. The term is called the Septuagint, at least that's how I'm going to pronounce it. 
So in a time with many miracle workers, with many failed messiahs, Jesus, the historical Jesus, in my view, and based on the conclusions I had in a previous video, became the basis for a new religion. But it was not anything more than a sect of Judaism until Jesus became too close to God for it to be considered non-blasphemous. And this key change um, was driven by the inclusion of Gentiles into monotheism. So the argument that I would make is that the Jesus movement was an entirely Jewish sect based in Jew Jerusalem with primarily with exclusively Jewish followers until 20 to 30 years we see an influx an introduction to, to and an influx of Gentiles within the Jesus movement and their their worldviews and their understanding of the Jewish text through their pagan eyes is what in my view eventually leads to a Jesus that is so divine as to be incompatible with Judaism. And that break comes in John. The Gospel of John is in, it's even in the text itself, how they're being thrown out of the synagogues and there are tests that people are saying to, to exclude people who worship Jesus as a God from their Jewish services. So that is how, in my view, a Jewish Messiah became a pagan Christ. Way back, you might remember I talked about the, the fact that ancient Hebrew does not have abstractions. It does not have a linguistic framework for the kind of abstract thoughts uh, and abstractions that are necessary to do things like philosophy. Greek influence over Judaism continued, not only because it was the worldview of the people with the most money and power, but also because it makes a lot of freaking sense. <laughs> and it's therefore intellectually attractive. And while Judaism, as practiced by Jews, remained monotheistic, I have my title of the slide here is Enter the Pagan, like Enter the Dragon, but Enter the Pagan. Get it? Get it? The introduction of Gentiles into the Jesus sect altered its historical trajectory. By the time that Paul is writing and afterwards, you have quite a range of people who have been converted to the Jesus movement. Some were oppressed, slaves, women, the uneducated, the poor, but there's also evidence that there were wealthy and very literate people involved in the church. Over time, as the Christian church moved, uh, grew, it was those men who had the money and the power and the training in Greek rhetoric and Greek language and Greek philosophy who became the leaders of the church. These men drew their aesthetics, their norms, what is desirable and, and not from Greek notions for, let's say, perfection, intolerance of cognitive dissonance, the reliance on reason rather than revelation, and all of these are in direct conflict with the way that Jews have experienced Yahweh through revelation, not reason, and they aren't confined by notions of perfection and unchangingness, that God can be a contradiction because God is God. Um, you know, So these are two very, very different worldviews that we're dealing with. So in the historical Jesus video, we saw that the main debate we focused on there was what was the nature of Jesus' human body to his divine nature. And the Trinity is really a debate about Jesus' divine nature related to God's divine nature. So there are kind of two sides of the same coin in that way. In the rest of this talk, I'm going to make reference to the Proto-Orthodox. And the Proto-Orthodox is just the term that I'm using, taken from Bart Ehrman, to refer to the side that eventually won the, or the theological debates, but before they won. So the Proto-Orthodox are the people who have the positions that we now associate with Christianity. And from my assessment, and I don't think this is particularly original, but what the orthodox position seems to do is balance between two extremes. They're trying to fit an anthropomorphic desert war god and his Jewish son into Greek philosophy while maintaining Jewish monotheism. That to me is the problem of the Trinity. Now monotheism has advantages when it comes to Greek philosophy because it carries with it already some of the ideas necessary. Unity, non-compound, changeless, you need one thing to have that, right? Unity and monotheism. But the problem is that if you are making assertions about Jesus' divinity and then also the nature of the Holy Spirit, you have 
um, instead of one god, three gods. So the proto-orthodox are, in my view, are always working to not overemphasize unity, the unity of the three in the Trinity. In other words, making Jesus and and the Holy Ghost disappear because God is just so powerful. That's one, that's the extreme of monotheism. And they were trying to get away from the extreme of polytheism, which is three separate indistinct distinct gods. So it seems when I look at how the proto-Orthodox position themselves, it's primarily with this balancing of not too much of one god and overshadowing the other two elements, or not too much distinction between the three elements. The debate about the Trinity is a lot more about Greek thought than about the scriptures, because most of the things that they're talking about in the debate around the Trinity is not found in the scriptures. The proto-Orthodox position on Jesus is that he is both human and divine, but not more one than the other, and that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, quote, co-equal, but not. So, um, some bullshit about the difference of being between being generated and being created, blah, 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 word games. Um, but this is how they construct their logical arguments. In the um, chapter, Karen gets to the Council of Nicaea and talks about its importance in terms of establishing that the Father and Son are co-equal. But this doesn't end the debate about the Trinity. It continues on for centuries later. Because once they have more debates about the nature of Jesus, then they have debates about the Holy Spirit and blah, blah, blah. So basically you have, in my view, you have theological conclusions that don't make any sense. That they're really just total utter shit that they hide behind the word mystery. But the important thing that the bullshit does is it maintains the balance between true monotheism, where Jesus and the Holy Spirit disappear, and true polytheism, polytheism, where you're worshiping three gods. And whether or not it makes sense, I think is less important, to be honest, because from the time period of when this is being developed, it's the, it's the Greeks, the Greek notions, uh, the Greek principles that are being used and used to evaluate these ideas. And as long as they can conform some way with the Greek norms, then it can be acceptable within Christianity. So in, in my view, the Jews in their history have never required that Yahweh make sense. Yahweh is a force. God is a shock. God is not to be understood. And the way that they've gone about their practices over a long period of time has meant a, a lot of variety, but tolerance in terms of a range of practices, you know, from the Pharisaic to the Sadducees. You get people who worship God and the same God, mostly the same ways, but variety of views is allowed. But the Greeks can't handle that in their god. They can't have a god who does not make sense. So the problem is they start off with a Jewish god and they try to pull him through the Greek worldview. And it's, it, from a Greek point of view, Yahweh is a shitty, shitty concept. I mean, there's not a lot of rigor around Yahweh. And this, I think, causes a crisis in the early church. So in my opinion, this weakness in their concept of God is why they were so intellectually totalitarian. Every variation of belief is a threat to the faith. So because the religion was not based on ritual or practices, but on your opinion, controlling the opinions of people becomes very important in order to maintain some kind of credibility in this faith. So unlike their Jewish counterparts, Christians sought to marginalize, publicly reject, and stamp out the, their opponents' theological views. And again, just to reiterate, I think the reason that, a, a reason for this, maybe not the reason for this, but a reason for this, is that early Christians were really insecure about their notion of God, because they were making it up as they went. They didn't, it wasn't, you know, clear. They had to have all of these arguments. So I think it was that insecurity that led to the totalitarianism. And the larger social consequence of this was authoritarianism in thought. It's not enough to believe in the right God or to do certain practices, but you have to have the right beliefs as well, or your practice has no efficacy. And when Christianity comes into, it comes to be the state religion, then of course it has the authority then to put its thought control on wider and wider swaths of the population. Swaths? Swaths? So what did we learn today? Again, my thesis was that in Christianity, we have what I see as the result of men who are intent upon forcing a Jewish belief system into compatibility with Greek thought. 
It took centuries, but eventually a god of the Jews was taken and, Plato-like, fed into the pasta press of Greek rationalism. It produced a wide variety of Jesuses, and it had every combination of human, divine, monotheism, and polytheism that you could think of, um, and all of those eventually became heresies, but this proto-Orthodox movement became orthodoxy and worked to stamp out any other belief system. The reason why Christian theology makes no sense and relies on mystery is because it is the product of irrational assumptions being fed into a logical system. Propping up shitty ideas with logical structures does not actually make them good ideas. It doesn't transform them from being shitty. They're still shitty. Now, just to give you an example of what I've saved you from, I'm going to read from Karen on page 141, and I have entitled this slide, Typical Karen Shit. Ultimately, however, the Trinity only made sense as a mystical or spiritual experience. It had to be lived, not thought, because God went far beyond human concepts. It was not a logical or intellectual formulation, but an imaginative paradigm that confounds reason. Gregory, of a place I can't pronounce, made this clear when he explained that contemplation of the three-in-one induced a profound and overwhelming emotion that confounded thought and intellectual clarity. Yeah, I bet, because it doesn't make sense. Hey, hey, that's us done for this week. Next time we're going to be looking at Augustine and maybe getting through, through the rest of chapter four. Thank you for subscribing to my channel. If you haven't yet, please do. I'm trying, I'm almost to 700 subscribers and I'll probably do another bonus video once I hit that. Um, thank you for your support. Thank you for your comments. And I guess all that's left to say is that I've been Christy, you've been awesome, and I'll see you guys next week on a different Atheist Reads. Bye.